24 hours ago, I did not realize that I would be here. I thought I would be there. So I've pretty much always considered myself a gamer. I think I was about six years old when I played my first video game at a friend's house. And I remember being so jealous that they had this awesome device that they could play whenever they wanted. And a year later, I got one of these, the Donkey Kong Game & Watch. Now, yay. <laughs> so the controls were fairly straightforward. There was a button on the left to go left and right, and there was a button on the right to jump. And you controlled Mario from Super Mario Brothers and had to avoid the barrels that Donkey Kong, this giant monkey, was throwing at you. So there wasn't much to learn about the game. It took a while to master and to score a high score, but the rules of the game were fairly simple. So throughout my life, I've played a lot of games, and as technologies have evolved and graphics have gotten better, the games have become more and more complex. There's so many games out there right now that require you to actually put time and effort into fully mastering the game. And my favorite example of this is Horizon Zero Dawn. And in the game, you need to battle and hunt these robot animals. And it starts off with these reasonable small creatures that you can, shot with, uh, that you can kill with one arrow shot. But as the game goes on, the creatures get larger and meaner and trickier to kill. And it actually takes a lot of time before you're able to take down the biggest robots. It's a game where you need to master the different weapons and understand the different qualities of the monsters, uh, the robots that you're trying to hunt. And as games have gotten more complex, game designers put way more effort into creating environments where players are happy, engaged, and willing to put the time and effort into mastering and learning these skills. And I realize it's not unlike the work that I do in creating environments for developers where they're happy, engaged, and willing to put the time and effort into learning and mastering the skills that they want. So as mentioned in the intro, I'm a technical manager at FutureLearn, and we're a social learning platform offering online courses, programs, and degrees. And our company mission is to transform access to education. And I've been there for six years now. So I joined the company um, as an engineer, and I've seen our tech team grow um, from a tiny team of six people in a small basement um, to the 30 that we are now today. And as a tech team, our strategy is to grow our own software engineers. So since our entire company is all about learning, we believe that we should invest um, in our people. And when possible, we should try to hire less experienced developers, rather than hiring only the most senior software engineers. And we do this for several reasons. It makes it easier to hire, since the pool that we're hiring from is way larger. Um, and we can do our part in making the tech community more diverse. But also, it shows that we care about the progress that individuals make and makes it easier to retain people. It doesn't mean, though, that we really need to make sure our team is constantly capable of leveling up and having those processes and structures in place that allow them to do that. And the way I see it um, is that as a manager, I am responsible for the internal developer experience. So from the time a person applies for a job with us, to their onboarding and time at the company, all the way through to when they decide to leave. We need to make sure that people have the best experience that they can. So I've been full-time focused on this for the past two years now. And the more I do this, the more I realize that this is just another variation of user experience. So it's all about understanding the motivations, the emotions, and the behaviors of people, and then providing the best experience that you can for them. I wanted to specifically focus here on video games user experience, 
Because I think it's a very similar type of environment that we're trying to create. An environment where people are engaged and focused on learning and mastering specific skills. So that's what this talk is about. So I'll be looking at 10 lessons that we can learn from game design and how we can apply them to teams. Um, so just two things to note. I'm not talking about gamification here. So this isn't about making your time at a company more like a game where you score points and there's this huge leaderboard with best kick-ass developer or anything like that. This isn't about how we can gamify work. It's about using analogies from game user experience to better understand how we can make the developer experience better. Second thing, I've not worked in the games industry myself, but as an outsider looking in, I have a suspicion that they can kind of, they should be able to learn from the way they're making their games. Um, they, they should be learning um, from their own games um, to create a culture um, that focuses on developer experience. So to structure this talk a little bit more, I'll be looking at three different areas of game design, and within those areas, I'll highlight different game examples, so what lessons we can learn from them, and then how to apply those lessons in your team. So first area is starting a new game. So I mentioned the example earlier of this Donkey Kong game where the controls are purely left, right, and jump. And nowadays, games are more complex than this. So this is an overview of the game controls of Uncharted. And even though I've played this game, it's always tricky to remember what are all the different things that you can do. But most of the games, though, they won't just drop you into the game and go, right, off you go, figure it out. Almost every game nowadays has a phased introduction of the various game mechanics. So in Uncharted, all the controls get introduced one at a time. So this is a picture from Uncharted 4. So one of the first encounters is with this guy where you learn how to punch. So you get this little message here telling you to hit square to attack the enemy. Later on, you get another scene where you learn how to interact uh, with an object by pressing triangle. And ev eventually, in similar ways, you learn how to dodge, jump, climb, shoot a gun, until you're able to do all the base actions of the game. And in this game, it's done fairly quickly. Within the first half an hour, you've pretty much learned the core mechanics, but it's still staged in such a way that you focus on one single skill at a time. So in other games, the staging takes place across the entire game. So for instance, in God of War, as the story progresses, you slowly learn new abilities that allow you to solve different puzzles and unlock different areas. So the image here shows this chest that is covered in these weird red vines, which you can only destroy once you're able to throw these weird red bomb thingies on them. And the game slowly builds up what you need to know, allowing you to learn gradually. So lesson number one, don't overload new starters. So when someone new joins, they've got a lot to learn. New people, new ways of working, new code base, new terminology, new abbreviations. So come up with a way to stage your onboarding and actually plan it out more deliberately. So the main thing we have is an onboarding checklist that we create for every new starter. So we have an onboarding template board in Trello, which we regularly update. And the week before a new starter starts, we create a copy and customize this. So the board contains a cheat sheet, um, so a list of useful information that might be tricky to remember, so names, where people sit, links to various internal sites. Um, so it's all about reducing the amount that, of info that a person needs to remember. It then also includes a breakdown of what we expect them to do by when, so looking at the first few days, the first two weeks, the first month, and the third month. So it's all about setting the expectations of what they'll be doing. And then we have various things to read and links to guidelines and resources. So all of this is about allowing a new starter to have one starting point where they can find all the info they need to get started. So going back to video games, another thing to note when starting a new game is who is responsible for teaching these new skills. So a lot of the early games 
would come with a manual that exactly explained what each button did and how the game worked. I remember playing games, though, where I kind of just skimmed the manual, threw it away, and was like, all right, I can do this. And I only discovered a certain move was possible like a month after when my friend was playing it with me and pointed it out that that thing I was able to do. Um, so at the time, the onus was very much on the player to figure these things out for themselves. So most games now, though, embed that onboarding aspect into the game. So the game is the one responsible for teaching this new thing. So going back to Uncharted, it's just a simple hovering message. But it is a hovering message that won't disappear until you've hit the little square button. So in other games, you might have like a sidekick or a wise old person who explains to you what this new ability is um, that you just got and how you used it. So the teacher in that case is much more ingrained as part of the storytelling. But in both cases, it's, it's the game itself that goes, right, now it's time to learn something. So lesson number two, support and guide new starters. So it's all well and good to have an onboarding plan and checklists, but you don't want your new starter to go at it completely alone. So whenever someone new starts, we pair them up with a mentor. The mentor is on their same team, sits close by to them, and is there to help support and guide the new starter during the first few months. They don't necessarily have to pair directly on work together, um, but the mentor is supposed to make sure the new starter has something to work on and is around for any questions they have, and just generally should be the first point of reference that the new starter can go to. And we make sure that they regularly catch up and together come up with a plan that, uh, for anything that additionally needs to be added to that onboarding plan. So final thing when you start a new game is understanding what your current goal is. So once a player knows how to play the game, they still need to be able to figure out and choose what missions or quests to focus on, and then how to achieve them. So this is an example from Horizon Zero Dawn again. So on the left, you have multiple quests that you can choose from. And whichever one you have selected, it shows a breakdown of all the different things that you need to do to achieve the mission. Similarly, once you've got a mission selected, it will appear as this to-do list on the left of your screen um, with what you still need to do to achieve your goal. And again, a lot of the older video games didn't do helpful things like this. So I've played games where I accepted a quest, and I was told that I need to go to this little village. And then I left the game for a few weeks, and when, when I came back to it, couldn't remember what the damn name of that stupid little village was. And the game provided no other clues as to what to do or where to go next. So lesson number three, make it clear what people should focus on. So in our team, we expect everyone to set personal development goals and to reflect and review them on a regular basis. So we don't want people to set goals once a year and then forget to look at them and make progress on them. Um, and as managers, we should be regularly checking in with people and making sure that they're continually working on them. It's also why we want people to write them down and record what they've done even in the cases that um, they haven't achieved the goal that they had set, most probably it's because they learned something else instead, and they should be recording and writing down what that something else was. Next to that, they should also tie in with the bigger picture career goals um, that the person has. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail here because I did a talk about this last year, um, how to brainstorm these type of goals. So if you're interested in that, check that video out. And once people have set goals, we encourage people to look for opportunities to share them with team members. So mainly because having them visible means that someone else might be able to help out with them. For instance, pairing on specific problems or encouraging someone to lead on specific work or project. So the second area that we're going to look at is how games help with learning new skills. So one of the most important aspects of learning something new is understanding whether or not what you're doing is the right or wrong way of doing it. So going back to the Uncharted example, it's quite low key here. Once you've pressed the square button, the message just disappears, so you know what you've done was right. 
And a lot of the feedback in Uncharted is the same type of feedback that you would expect in real life. If you misjudge a jump and miss a ledge, you fall to your death and die. Well, may maybe not completely realistic, because I don't think we often do that on a regular basis, but you, you get my point. Um, similarly, if you uh, shoot an enemy, he bleeds and then dies. Uh, we might not really think of it as feedback, but the game is actively telling you where an action you ha did had an actual immediate effect. So lesson number four is give people direct and timely feedback. So when possible, we want to encourage our team members to give each other direct and immediate feedback themselves. Especially when it's constructive feedback, it needs to be delivered in a timely manner. And it's part of our roles as managers or leads to facilitate that this happens. So one of the things that I tend to do is just making myself available for whenever someone wants to prepare for a conversation or wants to role play to trial out how to say stuff. And there are two books I found that really help with getting people to think about feedback. So the first is Difficult Conversations, which is all about um, approaching conversations and structuring them better so the points that you're trying to make have a better impact. It's not just a useful book for difficult conversations. I think any conversations or communication that you're having benefits from this book. So think about the dialogue that you have with someone when pairing and explicitly thinking about what impact your words have on the other person while you're working with them. The second book is from the same writer. It's called Thanks for the Feedback, and it's written more from the point of view of being able to hear and take in feedback and understanding what the various triggers are that might make you react to feedback. So I thought I was quite open and understanding about receiving feedback. But last year, I ended up reading this book um, a week or so before I got some feedback myself. And I noticed myself reacting and dismissing some of the things in exactly the way the book kind of told me I would. So both of these books are really useful. So going back to games again, sometimes feedback doesn't happen immediately. But rather, the game allows you to review and look back at something that you did. So for instance, in Overwatch, when you're playing a match against other players, if you get killed, the game waits for 10 seconds before you can get back into the, into the fight. And rather than do nothing here, the game shows you how you died and uses it as an opportunity to learn from. So lesson number four is provide, well, that's not lesson number four, that's lesson number five, provide space to reflect and learn from the past. So I try to encourage people to do more self-reflection and really get a sense of um, how people have been doing things recently. So lots of teams often do retrospectives for their team, but people rarely do this activity on their own for themselves. And I think lots of people can benefit from taking that time to stop and review what they've been doing. Beyond self-reflection, though, the other best resource to learn from is feedback from others in a more recurring and regular structure. So we're currently using a tool called 15.5 to help with our 360-degree feedback, where people can nominate peers, and feedback is given by those peers, the manager, and the person themselves. And the tool takes care of the nudging, anonymizing, and sharing, so it makes that process a whole lot easier to manage. And since setting it up, um, we've collected feedback on a much more regular basis than we were before. So going back to Uncharted, at this stage of the game, you normally also can't die yet. That guy there will just keep on standing there waiting for you to punch him um, until you finally learn how to punch. Um, so there's no opportunity for you to get knocked out by him to die at this stage of the game. He's just standing there waiting a bit for you to uh, hit him. So the game is set up to ease you into learning and applying these skills. Another example here is Mass Effect, where you can go to the shooting range to train and try out your different weapons and powers without dealing with actual enemies. So you can't die again, and it allows you to trial out and learn how to master specific skills. So lesson number six is provide opportunities to apply new skills. 
So at FutureLearn, every person has a training budget, which isn't uncommon. But we really try to get people thinking about how they'll use your budget, how they'll use their budget in a way that works for them. So while I love conferences, I know not everyone finds them as useful. And I often suspect that we encourage people to use their budget on mainly conferences, because that's kind of the easy option. It's up to us as managers to help identify what other types of training are out there. So things like improv workshops, writing or public speaking courses, getting a trainer in for a day. We need to be the ones to find and offer the opportunities that people can use their budget on. So we've got a rolling document with ideas constantly of what are the things out there that people could do. Another thing we do are lots of different learning events. So these are regular internal events that are mostly self-organized for people to get together and learn something in different ways. So these are a couple of them. We've got talks we love, where we watch and um, discuss an interesting talk that someone has seen. So this can be a conference talk that they've seen at a conference. Um, in learning hours, someone will just teach something in an hour. Architecture Club and Frontend Catch-Up are for the people who are interested in those topics to get together and um, discuss um, kind of the things that have happened more recently. And Conference Club and Leadership Study Group are for people who want to improve specifically those areas. So they're all different ways for people to learn something internally. And these aren't the only ones we have. Um, we're constantly um, encouraging people to identify and start up the types of events that they think they need. And then finally, uh, finally, we also have book clubs and course clubs. So that's for people who want to read or take an online course together, um, who then meet up regularly um, to discuss that, the, the progress that they're making and how to apply what they've learned to their work. So the final area that we're looking at is the actual leveling up of a character. Now, not all games allow you to do this, but there are a lot of role-playing action, even racing games nowadays, that have some form of leveling. And there are a lot of different ways that games have implemented this ability to level up. So I want to have a look at some of the variations and the effect that they have on the player. So the basic concept of leveling up is this. Your character starts at a specific level. You gain experience by doing things in the game, like battling enemies or finding treasure, some games call this experience points, other skill points, or action points, but they all pretty much mean the same thing. It's a way to increase your level. Now, up until this stage, I think most games are quite consistent. There are exceptions, but the majority of games with leveling up will follow this pattern. So where they differ is with what happens when you reach the next level. So the simplest version is where when you reach the next level, your character becomes stronger in some predefined set way. So for instance, in Kingdom Hearts, um, this is a game where you meet various Disney characters, and Goofy and Donald are your sidekicks. Um, each level up here is associated with a specific increase or ability. So this picture in the top right shows a message that Goofy is now level three and therefore his defense has increased. And with level four, his strength increases. With level five, he unlocks a special ability. So in this type of leveling, with each level up, you get a specific increase that the game has preset. But it's a way to celebrate your character getting stronger and progressing through the game. So lesson number seven is acknowledge people's growth. Now, I'm always surprised to hear that there are companies out there where they'll only give salary increases if a person asks and lobbies for it themselves. In my opinion, you should start off with the assumption that your engineers will learn and grow, and you should be always taking the time to review and adjust their salaries accordingly. So we do salaries for every person, salary reviews for every person every year without them asking for it. So most of the time, we'll at least try to give an inflationary increase. And then depending on the person and the progress that they've made per year, um, they'll get a small, medium, or large increase. And with each review, we compare the salaries of the people in the team with comparable skills and experience 
to make sure that we're always being consistent and fair across the entire team. So going back to games, the next types of leveling up all allow the player to choose what happens when they level up. So in the first variation of this, the player gets to choose themselves what stat or attribute to increase. So one example of this is Dark Souls. Um, so those values in blue are all the attributes that the player can choose to invest in and, and increase. In these games, it's really important to know what each attribute means, how it affects you, and how you can apply it in the game. So lesson number eight, expose basic competencies and how they are used. So we've got several sets of competencies based on what role you have. So our ones for software engineers are curiosity, communication, technical skills, teamwork skills, and initiative. And we use these whenever we're hiring and interviewing to make sure that we're always taking all of these areas into account and that we're consistent and fair in how we are reviewing people. We also have more advanced competencies for the more senior roles in the team. And we can use these in conversations about career progression, during salary reviews, or when providing feedback. So we have five shared competencies that each of the roles have. And then we have one or two specific competencies for specific roles. But having those competencies, it means that we're framing those discussions with the attributes that we value and care about. And that we're also explicit and transparent that these are the values that we care about. Plus, we have a common agreed on language to discuss all these things as well. So the next way a character can level up is by choosing a special ability rather than a stat to increase. And this is where skill trees and pathways appear in games. So this is Horizon Zero Dawn again. And at the start of the game, you have the skills in that first row. Each time you level up, you gain skill points, and you can, you can exchange those skill points to unlock whichever skill you want. You are bound, though, to that structure um, of the game. So you can't uh, unlock something in level four if you don't have level two or three yet. In the end, though, the expectation is that all players end up unlocking everything in this tree. It's very much up to you to decide what order you do them in. But if you stick with the game, you unlock everything. So a similar example is the latest Tomb Raider. It's just visualized in a different way. So rather than having it as a kind of like graph, here it's more about which skills are adjacent to the ones that you already have. So again, the customization is in the different order. But in the end, in this game, you'll have completed everything. Another approach is where it's much, much more modular. So this is Mass Effect Andromeda. And in here, you're never expected to unlock all of these skills. You can only invest in a certain number of them. And it's up to you to decide what type of character you want to create. So it very much also depends on your style of playing on what the right decisions are for you. So another version of this is uh, the latest Assassin's Creed. So here you have three different areas, hunter, warrior, and assassin. Again, it's up to you to choose what abilities work for you. For instance, if you rarely use your bow, it's not really wise to invest your points into the hunter area, because pretty much all the things in there will be affecting the stuff that you do with a bow. So both me and my husband actually play this game. And I'm always fascinated in seeing the different skills that we've unlocked and how our gameplay is actually quite different. I would never be able to play with the character that he has created because it just doesn't suit my style of gaming. So lesson number nine is allow people to choose their own path. And what I mean by that is allowing people to generalize or specialize whichever they want. So we used to have front-end and back-end engineer as titles. But a few years back, we got rid of, of those and turned it into just software engineers. So we noticed that having those labels in the first place was creating unnecessary barriers. And we didn't really acknowledge the different types of skills that people had that weren't covered by those two areas. So rather than expect everyone to be full stack or everyone fits nicely in a front-end or back-end box, 
We're giving people the opportunity to choose what skills they want to invest in. That doesn't mean, however, that we have to highlight how people differ from each other. So we recently introduced a spreadsheet where people can say how comfortable they are in specific areas. So we mainly use this um, to allow people to figure out who on the team they should be going for when they're asking for help to deal with something. Um, but we've also started using it to make sure that the makeup of teams is balanced in the um, skills that we want. And again, this is, um, people fill this in based on what they believe about themselves. We don't tend to use this for salary reviews or anything like that. It's more of a helpful tool for us to just visualize what, where people believe they are. So finally, what all these games do are visualizing and explaining how to progress in the game. They're all quite different styles, and there's quite a lot of complexity in it. Complexity in it. But all of these accomplish getting the player familiar with what is possible and then allowing them to compare and understand what might be right for them. And of course, these aren't the only ones that are out there. I've got an entire folder filled with like 30 different screenshots of different games of all the different um, skill paths and um, um, things that are out there. So final lesson is visualize what progression looks like. So we introduced a career development framework, career progression framework last year, um, but we're currently working on a newer version of it. And the first one we had was very linear. So similar to the games that we first looked at, where everyone was expected to progress in a similar way, one level at a time, until we ended up with a bunch of super developers who were all exactly at the same perfect level. And we realized that uh, that didn't really work for us. And we decided to go for a much more modular approach. Next to that, we also really wanted to um, include and link our competencies and also our different roles to it. So it's still a work in progress, but it looks broadly like this. And there's a lot going on in here, so I'm going to just break it down um, really quickly. So we have six different tracks. Each track is associated to different competencies. Each competency is linked to one or more roles. So these are the competencies that I mentioned before for the five different roles that I mentioned earlier. We then have four levels within each track. And each track will have three to four activities across those four levels. And when people start, we expect that they'll all be in this initial column. But as people progress, we expect there to be much more variation. So we have, might have one person that has these sections completed, focusing primarily on the top tracks, while someone else might have a completely different shape entirely. So it's very modular, because people are different shapes. They won't necessarily want to focus on the same things at the same time, or even ever, actually. We then did want to visualize what minimum level each role should be. So our software engineers uh, were the kind of simplest. So every software engineer that we have should be at least level one. Then we have our line managers. So to become a line manager, you would need to be at least a level two in everything. We then have our technical leads. So to become a technical lead, you would need to be at least level two in most areas, and then level three in the collaboration track. And then a similar thing for our technical architects, but in the tech direction and decision making track. And then finally, to become a technical manager, you would need at least level three in the management skills. And the last thing we wanted to show was where the responsibility and priorities of the roles lie. So this is to highlight what the focus of the roles primarily will be and who, in a way, should be taking ownership of these areas. So it's also a work in progress. We've mainly figured out the structure of how we want this to look like. And we're currently working on the actual breakdown of the different tracks and then figuring out what elements should go in there. So next to that, we're also adding what learning resources belong in each track so that we can make it easier for people to understand how they might be able to learn these actual skills. So the idea of this career progression framework is really to use it as a tool to have discussions about career progression with people and for people to plan and figure out what they next should be focused on. So in the same way 
that video games allow people to see where they are and what is possible for them. So those are 10 lessons of game design that we can apply to building cultures where people are engaged, motivated to learn, and motivated to progress and level up. So to recap, don't overload new starters, support and guide new starters, make it clear what people should focus on, give people direct and timely feedback, provide space to reflect and learn from the past, provide opportunities to apply new skills, acknowledge people's growth, expose basic competencies and how they've used, allow people to choose their own path, and visualize what progression looks like. So these aren't the only lessons, I think, that you can take from video games. These are just the ones that jumped out to me. So the next time that you play a game, I want you just to stop and think for a moment. What is this game making you experience? And is there something in there that you can learn from and apply to what you do? So as managers and as tech leads, our main focus is in creating developer experiences. I think in the busyness and hecticness of what we do, it's very easy to lose sight that in a way, our developers are our users. And we are the ones that should be creating experiences for them that allow them to grow, progress, and level up. So thanks for listening.